Hello, everybody, fans of guests of World of Paleoanthropology. Today is another episode of The Story of Us. I know it's been a little bit since we've had an episode, but I have exciting news to tell you. We're going to have a whole lineup extending all the way through June right now, so it's going to be exciting. Today, we have a new guest, and I want to allow him to introduce himself. Oh, hello, Seth. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Sergio Almejija. But just Sergio is fine. Um, and I'm a researcher here at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, study ape and human evolution. Awesome. And, you know, this is, you study a field, not a field, but an area that I don't think I've really covered much on the channel. I think we've really focused really on not really going past 7 million years, honestly. I don't think I've really covered much at all about that. So I'm really excited to be talking more about apes and ape ancestors going back. I think I read on your website you researched up to 26 million years ago or around there. Well, whatever, whenever apes appear, which is probably around soon after that time. Okay. Now, what what interested you about this particular area? So, um, so a little bit of the backstory is that I was originally interested in just human evolution in, mm -hmm. in a broad sense. I was really not, this is when I was an undergrad student, um, wasn't sure what aspect of it. I was just intrigued by it. just natural sciences. I was studying biology. And then, so I started focusing also on genetics. I thought oh, man, it would be cool to study ancient DNA to, start, to understand human evolution. Then I got involved into field work in there are many archeological and paleontological sites uh, in Spain. I'm from Barcelona in the Northeast of Spain. And so I got involved in those over the summer as just as volunteer. And then actually around the area where I live, there are many sites that are older. So they, they are Miocene sites, they're they are like around 12 million years ago to, to nine million years ago. So it's before human evolution. Um, and I got involved in that research just, it was like a hobby for me, just really loved to be in the field digging out fossils, right? And I guess it naturally happened that I got more and more involved in the in the local research with local researchers and that were saying those fossils. And then basically, um, you know, something that started as a hobby is that I started to invest more time, more time and effort, and eventually got like a fellowship to keep studying them and that pay me for my PhD and so on. Um, and my interest very quickly grew into the gap in the knowledge that we have now regarding the origins, not modern human origins, but like just the origins of the human lineage as a whole, like, like the lineage of hominids did it appear in Europe, in Africa, what in Africa, from what kind of ancestor. Like I was in, studying those fossils just from the literature, the, the hominids, mostly from those finding in, in, in Africa, we were interested in, you know, Ardipithecus, Tropithecus. And, and then also we're studying the fossils of the apes that lived before the human evolution chapter uh, in Europe. And then uh, basically I always was very intrigued to kind of look at both like sides of that range and time and trying to understand how we went from those into the, the other, right? And then I, I would soon, very soon I realized that it's like a, one of the biggest unknowns right now because we don't, is there still a big debate about how the last ancestor of humans and chimpanzees look like, move around, what it was living, what kind of environment it was. It's still like very heavily debated, right? So that's been kind of been at the center point of my own research, right? To understand the origins of the human lineage alongside the origins of the lineages leading to the living great apes, chimpanzees, gorillas, and mutants. Because we have, we basically have almost no good fossils for each of them either. So that makes things even more interesting and complicated at the same time. That's fascinating. You know, and again, it's an area that we haven't covered and we're gonna delve deeper into the past here when with your research. But one thing I wanted to cover that came to mind just now uh, that I wanna make sure everyone understands when we're talking about the split between human evolution and ape evolution. Many people are sometimes confused or misled in the sense that they believe a chimp today was the same thing as a chimp seven million years ago, and that or they didn't evolve the same way. If you get my meaning, how have you seen that before? 
and how do you counteract that belief when you see it? Well, it's happening still today. And among the experts, you know, there are some experts that actually argue mm -hmm. that our ancestors with the chimpanzee was pretty much like a living chimpanzee. So this mm -hmm. is not just an idea of the past. This okay. is still like a, a, a current like line of thinking, you know, um, and I don't, I'm not a hundred percent against that idea. My point by looking at how early hominids like Artipithecus look like or are roaring and how some fossils that existed before living apes and humans originated look like, I see some similarities as well. I see similarities between early hominids and some anatomies of the body are kind of a chimpanzee, others are kind of more like a gorilla, others are kind of different from anything else. Others are more like those fossils that lived before. So actually my point is, okay, I think it's okay to start with a template that that's kind of chimpy-like, but it was not exactly like a modern mm -hmm. chimpanzee. It probably had some things were different. For example, my own research suggests that the hands were not like a modern chimpanzee in terms of the length proportions. Probably the fingers were a little shorter, closer to the human relative length than the chimpanzee length, which is more like an orangutan. Other things, parts of the hip also seem to be very similar in afferences, therapeutic afferences and primitive apes, more so than to any living apes. So I think the picture is more complicated, but probably more informed when you bring all together. But still, they're like, you know, some I have very good colleagues of mine that they think that the, in their mind, chimpanzees are kind of living time machines, that they mm -hmm. kind of never evolve much, just a little bit from that ancestor. So they are not ancestor, but they consider them as a very good model for that ancestor. So it's not, it's not this is still like a heavily debated, like, an interesting topic because understanding the nature of that ancestor is, is going to tell us like the starting point of human evolution, basically, but also the starting point of chimpanzee evolution. And the big, the biggest problem that we have in that front right now is that we have no virtually no fossils of chimpanzees or even mm -hmm. gorillas or orangutans. So it's really hard to tell exactly how the ancestors of living great apes look like because the apes that do we have many fossils for they don't quite look exactly like any of the living ones either. So it's really still like a very intriguing part of the evolutionary history of apes and humans. Yeah. And I know this has been talked about in a few other episodes, but just for viewers who might be new just to this video, why don't we have any great ape ancestral fossils? Well, again, that's another mystery on its own. We, so first, we might have them. And we might not recognize them as such because they don't look like the living ones. That's one possibility. Mm. Another possibility is that we are not looking in the right places for fossil apes, ancestors of the living apes. Because if you look at the distribution of where modern great apes live today, most in Africa, you have chimpanzees and gorillas. You know, bonobos being a sub, like a subspecies of uh, a species of chimpanzees, right? And um, they live kind of in the, I mean, there are some living kind of on a savanna environment on the margins, but most of them live around the forest, the tropical to tropical forest areas in Africa. And then you have in Southeast Asia, also in very forested environments, we have orangutans and hylobatids, the lesser apes, gibbons and siamangs. But if you look at um, the distribution of fossil sites with apes, they are in places that there are no living apes today, or the environment was reconstructed as being very different from what the environment of where living apes live today, like places like all over Europe, in places of Africa, like the Chad, for example, or in Namibia, or in South Africa, or many places in Asia, like in Pakistan, in India, there are fossils that some people think are ancestors of foreign mutants that today don't live there. So it's a complete mismatch of where apes live today and where they used to live before and how they look today and how they used to look before. So therefore, th that causes all these conflict among different researchers about the meaning of each of the fossil apes. Are they, some of them ancestors of the living ones or they have nothing to do with the living ones or the living ones evolve in the same place where they are living today. So basically tropical rainforest in which it's very hard to find fossils nowadays. That's another possibility. Maybe there's just not, we have not found the, the fossils because they never preserve. Or per perhaps we're not looking in the right places because there are most of Africa, it's completely unknown from a geological and paleontological and archaeological mm -hmm. viewpoint. It doesn't mean there is nothing there. Look at the surprise of Sahelanthropus in Central Africa, for example. It's right. just, it was almost an accident. It means that how many other places of Africa are like hug with hominins and fossil apes that we just don't even know they ever existed. We're just kind of trying to, one of the points, more recent points of my research is just 
trying to bring attention to the narratives that we have about human evolution because they are based on the falsehoods that we have. But that doesn't mean that that's what it was before. That we, it's okay to build a story with what we have, but I, I think we should keep our mind open that there's a lot that we don't know yet that could dramatically change everything. Such as founding fossils, like of, let's say Homo erectus, Homo habilis, or chimpanzee fossils in Central Africa or in, in Western Africa, that would change completely the stories that we are, you have today in mind about how humans originated, you know, in, in Eastern Africa with the Rift Valley, the savannas, like taking over over the forest and so on. You know, this is just mm -hmm. based on the fossils that we have now, but there are more fossils from more different places that come up every year. So, so we should like kind of try to make an effort to change the narratives according to what we actually have today. I can't agree with that more. And the, I didn't really think about the fact that how much would change just by discovering those fossils in West Africa. That's definitely a big thing to think about. And I think uh, you brought up evolutionary narratives. And I think this is a perfect time to bring up the many narratives that you are bringing to the field in the new book that you have coming out in May. Yeah, sorry. I wish I had like a physical copy to show right now, but <laughs> I, I still haven't. Uh, but you, totally have, okay. you have seen a PDF of it, right? Yes, I I have read it, and it is. I it really honestly helped me in a lot of ways that I have been struggling in a few ways of thinking about how I go about things. But before we get into exactly what it how it you know what it is, what well the title is. I believe humans. Humans, and I think based on the review that you wrote, you got why it's called humans. Um, but the subtitle would be "Perspective on Our Evolution from World Experts." Um, and I can, I'm, I'm happy to talk to talk about a little bit about the book and the backstory. But before that, I like to gather your just first impression when you go got this book in your hands, because I'm sure people it's going to be a little different than what people expect. And I, I, for some, I think it's going to be like a nice surprise for others is going to be, this is not what I imagined this, this book was going to look like and not like it whatsoever. So I'd like to know your open, like, honestly, like what was your first reaction when you saw? Sure. I tried to make I, it different from all, I tried to make it different. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I just wanted to make this different specifically. Sure. I, I would love, we can definitely start to that way. So when I received the book, I, um, I never flipped through a book really. But when I get it, I just start right at the beginning. So uh, first I read what it was about. And I was very intrigued. That's what, you know, made me approach uh, you and your publisher, et cetera. Uh, but I got it and not, but I got it and um, I opened it. I saw the format and I thought, okay, this is going to be, you know, the intro. And then it was the whole book. And I thought, wow, this is different. This is unique. And I thought, one, how hard it must have been for you to actually put this together, get gather. So let me explain. The book is, you basically ask a set of questions to, I think it was 103 anthropologists and you have them respond and in their own words, how they feel and their experiences. You ask questions like, how do you combine religion and evolution? How do you view this and that? And it's, inciting fall into the minds of these uh, experts as the title says and it's fascinating it knowing the research and then knowing the people behind the research who put it together really creates an experience of where you can understand how they got to those hypotheses and conclusions better than when you just had the research and i think it puts forth those aspects but also humanizes everything that the research is and the people behind it and i think that's the real key that i think you were going for and i think you hit the nail on the head and i think it is a great book that many people who are in the field will really enjoy people who want to learn about anthropology it's going to be you kind of need to know a base i think before jumping in but that's that's perfectly okay. And the book is great. And I truly, it did help me in a lot of ways, um, you know, that I don't, uh, that are personal and I don't want to go into on a video that's going to go out everywhere, but I'd love to talk to you about it after if you want. But um, it was great. I loved it. So that's, that's my first impressions. 
Well, thanks for the for the nice words. So basically, the, the idea it was like a, an experiment, you know, that I did because and now I'm a full time researcher, but I used to be a professor before uh, different university, and uh, and I struggled to I had to teach among, among others primate evolution, human evolution, and and I struggled a lot because I really wanted to to teach everything I knew uh, in a way that was interesting. Um, but I didn't, then I realized that I am biased because I have, like everyone else, I have these narratives in my head of how things likely happen based on my own, like short, like, you know, shortness of view, like of what I study specifically. But, you know, I, I, I've been lucky enough that, sir, that I've been surrounded for many years for mo all my career with great colleagues that knew much more than me about anything and everything and I always fa was fascinated like the best times the best stories the deeper like uh, insights I always got them having a beer with one of them in a meeting or having lunch with them in the lunchroom like they're my colleagues and we're having all lunch together in the lunchroom in, in college you know in the school like those insights you don't get them anywhere else right so so then I, I switched strategies I was like what if I just try to show the different perspectives on these topics that we are studying human evolution about what is homo habilis or why we call this homo habilis or was the ancestor of humans and chimpanzees like a chimpanzee or not instead of just teaching my perspective on it or what i think i know about it i thought it would be mo much more interesting to just show the actual research these people think this based on this and these people think the opposite based on this other thing and i i kind of started teaching after a year or two in a way that it was more like the class the classes were not me teaching anything we're just debating things you know and i thought it was like the best classes the students were very happy they were intrigued they were they had to dig their their own conclusions from the work that they were reading and dissecting and they learned a lot i learned a lot and i thought would it be cool to have something like this in a, form, in a book format? Because I was thinking, would I write a book that I could use to teach at this kind of a little bit like that? And I could not come up with a way to do it without going too crazy. So the idea just started like a crazy idea in my head. And then I came up with the questions in this book, which are like 10 questions mostly. And some of them are just, how did you got started doing what you do today? You know, all those questions are like, you had a, like a round, round trip in a time machine, where would you go and why? That might be like superficial questions, but this is just, this is like the kind of question I would ask one of these colleagues if we're having lunch or a beer together as a way to gather from them what they find interesting and why. Because like, you can read all their papers, but you know, like whatever research agenda anyone has, like they have some underlying ideas or that, that they want to test or know more about. So my 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 question my my proposal with this book is like let's try to compile those ideas those stories from all these different viewpoints from people in the field now they're not just anthropologists there are, most of them are somewhere in the biological anthropology realm but there are many there are some archaeologists there are like psychologists there are like people who are writers there are like physiologists there are people who study uh, you know things that are related to understanding human nature and evolution but not specifically anthropologies and 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 even with the, anthro the anthropology biological anthropology archaeology like bulk of participants they have very different ideas so i thought maybe i can just gather all this together in one single book and make it kind of a little fun and entertaining in that sense that you don't you don't have any particular structure in terms of you have this length and you have this is the you have to write like if you were writing for a science article this is more like just talking whatever way you want take as much space as you need you know and and that's, so I started reaching colleagues that I, they were close to me started with I started with the more senior people because I found out that they have very clever ideas that they came up with like 20 years ago 30 years ago or even more and these ideas have kind of been forgotten now there are people doing new research with new methods and concluding the same things that other people conclude decades ago but just papers are just not people don't know about these papers anymore they forgot about them especially the new students and to me this was a way to kind of bring back all these very interesting people and their ideas there are also more young folks also in the, in the book but the growth of them are like the most senior in the field which i'm very proud to be able to have in this book i really like I cannot believe they kind of went with this crazy idea and participated in the book, honestly, because many of them, when I contacted them, I didn't even have a book deal with any publisher. I was just, this is my crazy idea. 
these are my crazy questions you want to play you know and you know and I was lucky enough that many of them like the ones especially that, that were close to me or they met me at, at some point they were like they trusted me and they trusted the idea and they trusted that I know what you want to get with this so I'm happy to help you if I can even though some some told me it, it makes me very uncomfortable to reply to these questions I have that answer to many people who did not participate in the end of the book and many, some participated, but they told me like, you know, this was daunting for me to answer these questions because I feel very exposed because in the end, in a, this is kind of behind the scenes of the field, what this, bring, this book brings about. Right. So I love the fact that you just dove into it. I mean, you got your idea and you went for it. And I think it really is going to turn out to be something that's really helpful for a lot of people. What do you think was the most insightful question that you asked overall? I know some people answer them differently, of course. So, um, I am not sure. So I can oh, look. Let me. I'm looking at them right now, and I'm mm -hmm. thinking. Um, you know, let's let's just do a, just a brief summary of each one. Sure. I don't want to read the whole thing just so people understand the kind of questions and, and what the idea okay. was. And then I can kind of conclude on the spot which one is my favorite right now because it has changed over time, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like a 10 questions plus a bonus question. And basically reach all these people, all these folks and ask them that to please, like, I didn't want to enforce anything to anyone. So I just asked them, could you please just uh, respond to at least five of them or more if you want? But because they cover different aspects, some are more personal, some are more like research focus. It was a way to give more freedom to people to decide whether or not they want to participate and to what degree, right? So these are the questions. Like the first is basically what I'm asking them about their beginnings. How did you got started doing what you do today? Many answers were like, oh, this trip to this museum when I was little, or this like elementary school teacher really was very inspiring. A lot of answers like that. Many were just like an accident, like in my case, that they were just following some interest as a hobby and then, oh, I'm a professor now, you know? <laughs> if, you, if you keep at it, like, just for the fun of it, you don't know what's gonna happen 20 years down the road. <laughs> that happened a lot. And another next question was, uh, could you mention a game changer in the way you think about all this field? Like, could be a discovery, a paper, a book? And that I think is gonna be a very useful question, the, the answers for the people because Basically, at the end of the book, there is a, a compilation of all these game-changing uh, works. And it's basically a list of books and, and articles or documentaries that these participants saw or read at some point and just like really like changed the way that they look at things in the field on, what, on the work that they do, or even drove their entire research after that. I think it's gonna be a, a, a very interesting resource on its own to have. Um, the next question is called is basically what what is is any um, amazing something you consider an amazing fact about human evolution and this was like a, just kind of breaking the ice a little bit you know some people were like oh I'm amazed that we're still alive in the planet after all this you know, <laughs> other other people are like uh, human stupidity is what amazes me the most you know it's kind of it's like a wild card but it's very it's, it's very entertaining that one um, then the more like research oriented questions are um, one of them is the the question about time travel that. I, I asked before, like, if you had a one-shot, like, um, ticket for a, in a time machine, where would you go and why? The idea with that is, like, someone who studies how uh, stereotypical appearances was walking, for example, instead of just asking them, um, like, why are you interested whatsoever in, in stereotypical appearances? No, I, why are you studying that stereotypical? Like, why are you studying the femur of stereotypical again? Instead of asking that, this question basically is a way to, for them just to, op op it's an open canvas for them to just explain what they do and why it's important. So many people would say, for example, oh, I would totally travel three million years ago, you know, to, to this part of Ethiopia, to see an astrolopithecus walking, because today we still have this big debate about ABC, blah, 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 blah. So it's a way to, in a little story tale, tell you what they work on and why it's important. Although actually many paleontropologists wish they could go to the future to see what's happening, which, which is very, very intriguing as well. The next question is driving factors. I was asking like, what basically started the human career? What happened? So an ape started evolving into lineage and ended up being us today. Some people hated this question. Like, there are no driving factors. You know, it's all 
you know, like chance and we don't know it's not not possible to ask this question other people as you know would give you details exactly of what happened that caused it you know well, that's and this happened and we become vibrant and because of that this other thing happened and we become handy and because of that we start being smart and because of that we have society today so some people it's very interesting that some people have all the answers and everything is very perfectly tailored to a bigger story others are like we really don't know cannot tell that much you know so that's about so an interesting outcome of this book Interrupt me anytime you want and you have to discuss any of this. <laughs> of course, yes. Uh, the next question was evolutionary lessons. And that was an important question for me at the beginning because what I wanted to get with this is can, basically, can the study of human evolution be not just interesting because most people study because it's interesting. It also could be useful. Can we learn something? There are some evolutionary lessons that we can learn that could be helpful actually from a, in an everyday life perspective for the way we live today or even for the future, right? And this is, an, so that was, this is a question that originally was one of the most important for me because I was having my own mental debates about this. This is all like, for what reason? What is the meaning of all this work? I don't sleep at night writing papers. Why, why am, am I crazy or why, why am I doing this? Am I alone? What, what do the other people <laughs> think about this? So that was, that was why I wrote this question. Right. And it's interesting because Everyone has a different reason, you know, that like mm -hmm. some people say this, this doesn't have any kind of direct impact in our lives, but it's fun. And I'm doing it because it's fun. Others would say, no, 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 it's really important because, you know, like, like some things that we are maladapted to, like being a biped, people with like back pain know what we're talking about. Like, it's interesting to know the, basically the framework in which we were built that was used for something different than what we're doing today and what the implications are. And also medical doctors, actually, I've been contacted several times by medical doctors that tell me that my research in some parts of the body that somehow have helped them do better surgery, which yeah. I'm still very intrigued. I, I wanna sit with these people and I wanna understand exactly what I say or done that is useful for them in that sense, because I would really love to know that what I'm doing is actually useful, not just fun. So it's right. like, a, it's very interesting that the question and those answers as well. Next question. Um, was uh, one that I think is one of my favorites now, which is, are we special? Are humans special? Yes, yes. I right. And that was originally not my favorite, but based on the answers, I think to me, it is one of the most interesting now because, you know, again, for some folks, we're not special. Every, every By definition, every species is special, right? That's mm -hmm. the answer. Many, of, this is a complete division here. You know, some <laughs> others are like, of course we're special. Like other species of animals don't go around writing books and asking questions about why you're working, what you do, you know? So like it gets into some philosophical territory here that is very interesting to see the different viewpoints, you know, and because some are very well developed of why we are clearly, yes, animals, but have like went to a different like morpho space, mental space that is not what we ever had before. It's nothing that's going to happen again. Other people are just, no, 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 no. We are just like a, outlier chimpanzee and these are the reasons why and they would mention all the things that we have in common with the chimpanzee or people would mention all the things that chimpanzees can never and will never be able to do it's very very interesting the next question also in this kind of more philosophical realm um was the question about religion and spirituality it was you know to me like i thought it was something that i need to include in the book but i was actually my in in my head i was thinking this is be the question that everyone ignores because especially scientists don't want to even talk about religion on a spirituality or they're just against it like plain like what that was my preconceived idea right and it was one of the biggest surprises for me in this book is that many people responded to this question and of course there are complete opposite viewpoints some very strong but it's all over. There are scientists that say religion and spirituality is outside the realm of science and they are not compatible whatsoever. Others would say they are different, different realms, therefore they are compatible with each other because one treats the wise and the others the hosts, right? Yeah. And especially, and it's very interesting that the answers from Americans are very different from the answers from anywhere else in the world. <laughs> I bet they are, yeah. You know, and interesting, like, not surprisingly, people from, there are some participants in the book from different Asian countries, like from, from Thailand, from Japan, um, from India. They, they tend to have a very different take on spirituality 
the, the role of spirituality in regular life, especially the Buddhists, you know? So it's, it's very interesting to, to see, like, to see how even one can help the other, which is something I never thought about. It. Like this one example, one of the participants, um, um, Yao Chai Manet, which is a, uh, a Thai woman who works in, the, in, French, in France, uh, that we feel work in primate evolution, Myanmar, Thailand. No, she's from, she's from Thailand. And, um, and she was telling that when she does field work in, in Myanmar, looking for fossils of early primates, and you know, there, every region has its own like knot, which is the spirit of that region. Mm -hmm. And every time they go out to look for fossils with the help of the locals, that they hire to the job, they all pray with the shaman to their knot to find fossils. And they always ask the researchers to her, which is leading the expedition, what do you want to find? And she says, fossil primates. And like, you know, when they go out and everyone is like convinced that their knot is helping them to find the fossil primate and they go out and actually find a fossil primate, it's like a, a party in the village that day. Mm -hmm. Everyone is motivated to find more fossils. The gods are helping them find the fossils. You know, right. so it's it really helps, you know, um, and then so that question was very interesting for me because you can see the divide and also the divide within the divides, mm -hmm. very very interesting. Sure. And then the so what was the the last question of the ten was just advice. I was asking everyone like if you know if someone would like to follow your steps or do something similar to what you're doing, like is what have you learned in your own life and career that you would like to share with this. These people doesn't matter, doesn't have to be just students. Officially, it's like student, college students, or anything, or PhD students. Like anyone who's interested in knowing more about evolution, human evolution, the kind of work that you do, what you what you would recommend. And there were all kinds of answers, but some of them are very thoughtful about you know like I recommend you specifically to focus on these things and not these other things. So I think that was very helpful advice for students that want to continue doing this as a future in their future as part of their job. Um, and others just basically give more general advice, you know, like this is fun. And if you are having fun, just do it, but don't worry about, don't get concerned about the career because it's not, if not, it's going to suck out all the fun of it, you know, which I kind of mm -hmm. agree on that point, but it's, it's all over, but it's very, very insightful in many cases. And then the last, the last question was the bonus question was, I was just basically asking if you had to ask all these questions to anyone leaving someone alive today or someone dead already. Like, who would you ask? And that was just a way for, it had that, like, several, several reasons to ask that, to ask that question. Was, was, one was just to, just to gather interesting ideas. You know, some people, oh, I would totally love to ask Platon, Plato, Plato, you know, in English, because like he, he had this idea of, you know, the idea, like, every species was an idea that was already pre-existing what he would think about natural selection and evolution. You know, he would, it would break his brain, you know? And it's interesting to revisit all ideas in the context of what we know today about human evolution. Other people would mention some of their colleagues and friends. Oh, you know, I would like to know what Professor Sassin Chat thinks about this. And some of these people are actually in the book as well. So you can then follow the num page number and go to that person and see what that person answers. Right. So it was very, very fun to do that part too. And those are, those are basically all the questions, um, because everyone responded using different like uh, vocabulary. Some are more technical, and others are trying to make an effort to like be very accessible. Mm -hmm. But the idea here, to me, was that you could just open the book randomly and see who you find there, or look for a specific person and go and see what that person says, and then like, hopefully they say something that is intriguing enough for the reader that would like to dig a little bit more on their own. That was my hope. Not to give all the to give many answers, but not all the answers. <laughs> and I think your hope will come to light. I really think people will once they get started. I know I did. You know, you read what one person says. It's like, well, what does this person think? Oh, they thought something completely different. Okay, well, what does this person think? Oh, it's still something completely different, and it just keeps going. And then you get really just ideas that you never thought would work or you never thought other people thought or you never thought you'd think yourself but you end up thinking differently at the end of the book it's a it's a book that really helps frame a lot of different perspectives from different areas and i think it really is as i said earlier unique 
I think you've really done something special with this, this idea. Um, of course, and a lot of people, um, I know this obviously because it mirrors somewhat similarly how I started this video series where I just thought it'd be a cool idea. Why not just email like the biggest people I can think of? And if they say yes, great. And if they say no, oh well. And I was shocked at how many people said yes, and it just turned into a thing. And, you know, it's amazing that when people really just put their foot forward, even if they're, you know, if you have the confidence, it's, it's going to happen. And I think we see that in a lot of things in this field. And we see it in a lot of the people you interview or ask the questions of, was there a time that you, well, were you happy with how many people responded or did you think you would get more or less? Well, let's say that the book has just over a hundred participants and I contacted many more than that. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, it's, a spe- it's, just, it's all probability, right? So not everyone is going to say yes. Um, of course. And everyone, some people wanted, but they didn't have the time at the time. Or some people I mentioned, like they they just found this project too daunting for you know that I write. This is not what I'm used to do. I'm very uncomfortable doing this, you know, talking about religion. I don't want to talk about religion. Or right. so it, I got all kinds of answers. People that I thought, wow, this is like this is impossible that this person is going to be interested, and they, they participated. You know, so it was some people that I had like uh, you know like heroes and sheeras like mm-hmm. basically send me to hell like <laughs> this is a stupid idea leave me alone you know like i'm busy yeah. you know and so it was for on the one hand i had many times in which i was kind of like fearful like oh my god you know <laughs> and on other times i was like i cannot believe this is happening this is awesome you know um, right and i have to say I mean, it took a long took me like over three years to get to gather all these wow. perspectives from the all these participants and sometimes many were via email others had to go meet them in person it's all kinds of ways i was but it was a lot of insistence you know because some people like were hesitant you know and i and i mm-hmm. and i didn't want to force any one hand but i wanted really to to convey to them why i thought this project was very important you know and to me it's this is the most important project i've done in my life and i have several papers that are like like big papers in my mind that took years of work to, to accomplish and polish um, but this this is like a different kind of project but it took me four years to to put all together um many hours um and many times i was just thinking why i'm doing this this is not gonna work you know like or i'm gonna i'm not gonna have enough participants or something's gonna fall through with the publisher or, you know, I was all kinds of ideas in my hand and my head of how things could go wrong, but I was still feeling like, well, but I'm doing this. I started working this because I thought it was going to be very interesting and important because you're going to see all these perspectives that you're not going to gather reading anyone's work. You need to talk to these people in person to gather this kind of stuff, you know, and some of some folks, they're just like almost living, they were like leaving the field at that time. Many are retired, like retired people that have incredible, incredible work that they did incredible work doing and books during the 70s and 80s and now they're retired and no one even knows about them and I, I just thought like this is a good way to like like highlight them like you know feature them this person is great because they did this stuff and this is what this person thinks about these things you know and and actually what I, I gather from other many colleagues that are participants of the book is that they are just they just want the book to get out so they can read what the other participants mm-hmm have to say right they're all curious about what the that. others cool. responded in each in each case so i think it's just gonna be i just hope that my main concern now is that people understand the idea of the book what it's really about because i don't want people to think this is some sort of your regular book that you just read from a to z and it's like a mm-hmm. whole universal narrative beginning middle end this is not like that this is different this is just compile the answers different answers to different given questions of people working in different some people study early primate evolution other people study human genetics other people that psychology other people study stone tools 
And it's very intriguing and interesting how their, in some cases, their answers are the same or completely opposite because they have different perspectives because they study different things within the big umbrella of human evolution. And I think I think only by looking at all together, you can start like growing a big picture idea of what's what happened and what's happening. And another thing interesting that came out with the book is like with the with the time travel and another question actually that I forgot to mention, which is one question was about the future of humanity, how, how right. humans are gonna look like hundred years from now or a hundred thousand years from now or a million years from now. And that really like some as you know, like some researchers would say, this is like impossible to answer. You know, it's like evolution is all contingency. Maybe a meteorite wipe us out tomorrow. Like we cannot make predictions. Other folks go full on into science fiction mode, like based <laughs> on all these evolutionary trends that like we can like follow over the last hundred years, hundred million years. Like this is what is going to happen to the planet. This is what's going to happen to humanity if these other trends continue. Blah blah blah. And they will make very like very specific predictions about humanity in the future. And that was very fun, I think, as well. Absolutely. So do you think after seeing all these perspectives from different people and reading them all and putting them together, do you think it's changed any of your perspectives? Um, yeah, it keeps changing every day. They keep changing every day. Like, uh, and I think it's a good thing just to see how much variation there is out there in ideas mm -hmm. and i think it's 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 it really makes makes me think that it's okay to have an idea today and have the opposite idea tomorrow and a different one the next day it's okay it's just it, they we don't know that to me that the truth is like we don't know we don't know much of what happened and we don't know much of what's happening today because it's based on what happened before and we don't know what's going to happen either you know and I think it's okay to um, to accept that, and then okay, what are the little things that we do know, and how with this, an example of this is, for example, I used to teach to my students, human evolution is a fact. You know, like we have all these fossils, and there are clear like um, chemical like approaches to to date things, and like we know that we have these fossils that look like this from this time period in this place that were found. That's like that's a fact. Now what that fossil means in terms of how the whole animal looked like, whether or not it related to us, was closer to us than this other fossil or not. Was it working like this or was it working like that? Those are things that is not so straightforward to have an answer. And, and it's something that's gonna come up in this book that different like opinions of how astropithecus walk, different ideas about, you know, like what caused the origins of the human lineage uh, or what is the most important like time in, in human evolution, completely different because different people have different like uh, interests, you know, and and someone who studies, for example, the food is going to have a picture of the evolution of humans that is different than the person who studies only the hand. And it's going to be very right. different than the, than the one from a person who studies stone tools and different from the one who studies teeth or skulls, right? So like to me, to me, basically, these answers show me that depending from which like side you look at things, you might gather a different perspective. Um, so it's changed my mind in many aspects. One of the one that I want to highlight is one of my questions was, is it important to study human evolution? Is it could be actually useful for us or is it just something for fun, right? Um, there, there have been several answers there that actually make me believe that it is fun and it's great to do it just for fun, but actually it could be very useful as well. You know, quite specific examples. There's one example from um, 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 Kunimatsu, it's a professor in Japan near Kyoto, uh, Yutaka Kunimatsu. He studies fossil apes, um, but, but teaches also human evolution in general. And he was like providing an example of relatively recent example of when he was like the, the big tsunami in Japan with Fukushima, like a nuclear station, all, all the devastation that it caused when, the, when it fell. Um, and he was saying that there were, if, if the company who built that station had followed the, act, the actual advice of the scientists, telling them to put the, like the backup like uh, engines, like higher 
on land were in a place in where there were no historical records of tsunamis ever reaching there, like, you know, the consequences would have been like much, much less catastrophic. And he says that this is something that only people who think in, in millions of years, instead of just in like today, tomorrow, the day after, don't have that perspective. The guys working the power plant, they don't care about a scientist telling them like, we have historical records in the, ge in the geology telling us that water could reach here in a tsunami and it would be a big catastrophe. They're like, are you like, are you, a, you know, like, are you a witch? Why are you telling me this is not, <laughs> this is nonsense. But you know, if they had actually followed yeah. their advice, things would have been better. So he always used that as an example of just the, just the idea of studying evolution and history opens your mind in terms of the scale of time. Absolutely. You know, and that, that could be, that alone could be very, very helpful in making decisions. That is a very good point. And you're absolutely right. And even people who do work in millions of years, I feel like it's still just so hard for the human mind to understand that time scale. And then, you know, when we talk, oh, well, you know, humans have only been around or, you know, hominids have only been around 7 million years. Well, what about dinosaurs? 65 million years. It just keeps going and going. And it's, I, it's so hard to explain to people who don't work even in geological time, any time that's farther than that. And I think putting it in ways that they can is something researchers, scientists, and science communicators need to work on doing because like you just said, it could be a very important for the future and simple thing, not simple, but important things such as building the back of generators or engines somewhere where there won't be a tsunami. Yeah. So don't worry, don't worry. Um I was just I was just say like I think it's now in your hands, people like you, to make sure. I mean what the kind of work you do is really it's really important and very hard, in my opinion, because like something that takes years of like any research article, any decent research article in anything, it takes years of just compiling data, analyzing data, understanding it, writing it, writing it, things up, publishing. But then try to convey all that complexity and amount of work and the meaning and implications of it in a, in a way that it's simple and interesting enough for anyone else to actually give a damn about it and read about it. That's really hard. And so I'm, you know, like my, I, I find it hard for me and working this book is I'm kind of my way to do something along those lines because I'm more like a research article writer person. Mm -hmm. And I found this very, very uh, challenging to do. I'm very proud and happy that it's, it's gonna happen, but, you know, I don't know if I could do what, you know, what you do constantly trying to convey like uh, in a simple and interesting way, the, the discoveries as they, as they happen, it's hard. So I, I'm just going to just say, like, no way to say thanks for the work you do. And, you know, don't worry about the details. You know, it's just the important thing is to, to, I think it's important to just to bring to the mystified science, the mystified scientists, you know, scientists are normal people. They come from the same place as anyone else. They have mommy and daddy issues like anyone else. And that's also something that comes up in this book. And, yeah. you know, and it's just like someone goes crazy doing one, one thing and that's what it does, you know, and after many years doing it, it's going to be good at it. And that's one of the messages I think coming from the, from the answers. Many, like some, so for example, some folks think that, you know, researchers are like kind of different, you know, they're smarter or, or some of them, oh, they come from this family that everyone there is a doctor, but I, I never do but that's not true. Like it's it's true in some cases, but there are many other cases, including many big names in this book, that they tell you their backstory and they had it much harder than any of us today. You know, mm -hmm. much harder. They like live through wars, and they have right. families already, and they still manage to like study and get later on professor or research jobs just because they keep going because they that's what they like it to do. You know, and they still had to do other jobs on the side, you know, so that to me alone is some examples of that from the more senior people It's really humbling and exciting and, and I, I hope that, that, you know, that other people, people like you can convey that to, to more people. So, you know, to bring to me, like the take home message of this book is like science, evolution, human evolution is for everyone. Absolutely. There's, and also anyone can get interested on it and, and provide something, some new ideas. 
you know, I don't think we could end on a better note than evolution and science is for everybody and everyone should try to get involved. And I really appreciate what you said. It does mean a lot to me. The work that I do is definitely not for me. It's because I believe that a happier society is an educated society. And I want to do my part to create that, whatever small or large part that may be. And, you know, I'm just, it makes me happy that I get the chance to talk to individuals like you who are doing the work and I, it's just worked out great. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And if you had any final words, I will give the proverbial mic over to you and then uh, we'll, I'll, I'll end the record button. Well, I guess I will just say thank you all for listening. And if you ever have a look to the, to the book humans, I hope you find some answers that are interesting to you. All right. It'll definitely be linked in the description below. So look for the book there. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Have a great rest of your day.